we were motivated by uh, by the music. The music was always our motivation, and we knew that we were tired of hearing the same old thing over and over. So that's we wanted to make new music so we could hear some new new, new music on the radio. We had a certain style that we played in when we play on other people's sessions. We'd leap into some of these tonal songs, practicing them on other people's sessions. So uh, we got a lot of experience, you know, trying ideas because uh, we were in the studio every day. You're listening to Staring at the World with Bodine's Kurt Newman, a T. Torrance Productions original podcast. Hey guys, what does Steely Dan, Cher, Michael Jackson, and Elton John, Barbara Streisand, and Toto all have in common? Mr. David Page, stick around for my interview. Hey everybody, this is Kurt Newman, and this is the Staring at the World podcast. If you've listened to music in the last 50 years, you've been hearing the music of my next guest, his music has been the soundtrack of all of our lives from Steely Dan to Cher to Michael Jackson, Elton John, Barbara Streisand, more than that, and Toto as well. He's a six-time Grammy Award winner. He's contributed to over 2,000 albums, shaping the sound of popular music. This man has been at the sound and the soul of much of the music and lyrics we've heard. Today, we're staring at the world with a legend in the music industry. Please welcome to the show, Mr. David Page. Hey, how are you out there? Hey, we're good. We're glad you are here with us. I have to wonder right from the start, how did you ever figure 2,000 albums? I mean, how did you get to I that think, number? I think, that's, I think that's a little overblown. I think it starts out being 500, and then yeah. it gets to 1,000, and then you find out that all your albums were released and connected to these records here. So it's kind of uh, 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 sometimes it's a surprise to me, too. Yeah, because it might be a little overblown, you know, maybe, I think maybe, maybe 500 to a thousand. OK, I've contributed yeah. to about 20, maybe. So yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> a lot like of records. Yeah. yeah, that's a lot of records. That is a lot. I, I want to talk to you about um, your childhood. The thing about doing these podcasts, that's great for me because there's so much I learned about you that I had no idea. You know, yeah. and that's the cool thing about being able to do this podcast. And this podcast, I'm kind of coming from this perspective. It's called Staring at the World because it's a lyric from one of my songs, which the song is about your perspective, you know, where you're standing in any given moment is, is your perspective on the world. And right. how you were raised kind of has a lot to do with that. And I read about your childhood and it was pretty incredible to me. So I was wondering if you could talk about a little bit uh, where you were raised um, as a little kid and who your dad was, because I know that was a big influence on you yeah. and stuff, and how that affected you a little bit. Could you talk to us about that? Yeah, I remember uh, first playing the piano when I was about five years old. I think my dad was working with Mel Torme or Elle Fitzgerald or both. Yeah. And he was doing a song called Blues in the, Light, Blues in the Night. So that song, that song goes, my mama done told me. That's yeah. how it starts. And I picked that out on a piano, played it. So my dad <laughs> thought, oh, well, he's got a gift. He's got the gift, you know. Yeah. So my dad kept uh, uh, allowing me to watch him arrange. He was a top-notch arranger, arranged uh, the Reed Charles songs on the Country Western album, I Can't Stop Loving You, Born to oh. Lose, which were all million sellers yeah. back in the day. So I was very interested in my, what my dad did for a living because he I would go down to sessions and I would see people like Shelly Mann and Louis Belson, these famous drummers and bass players like Ray Brown and stuff. And yeah. it would be a whole orchestra playing with a singer singing live. Sometimes like either Sammy Davis Jr. or Ann Margaret or whoever was singing. Man. And uh, I was just fascinating to me. And uh, uh, he urged me uh, when I was about 10 years old, I met Jimmy Webb for the first time. He was like about 17 and just started writing for Johnny Rivers. And so my dad uh, took me down and I was very influenced and very struck emotionally uh, to Jimmy Webb and the way yeah. he wrote songs and wanted to follow in his footsteps as well. So uh, I was allowed to uh, to witness all these professional uh, scenarios firsthand. And uh, I'm really lucky that I did because I I um, it's just uh, uh, gave given me more to draw on as a composer, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And. For anyone who doesn't know, um, Jimmy Webb 
wrote some of my most favorite songs, Wichita Lineman, like broke my heart as a child when oh, I heard yes. that on the radio. Yeah. It was like one of the most beautiful love songs, but Galveston or Up, Up and Away, the Fifth Dimension, those songs were huge when I was young. I mean, just they just dominated the radio. Yeah. So these yeah. were giant songs. And, and I wanted to ask you about your childhood because it seems to me when I was reading about you that you were pretty much born and raised in a recording studio watching this <laughs> process happen yeah. you know yeah. and not only did you get to see the technique that was used to record it but by i guess meeting some of these people like jimmy webb you also were learning the value of a song yeah. and and how important that was in this recording process can you how did that affect you going forward? Like, do you think when I talk about perspective, like not many kids would get that gift of perspective, right? It was all right. still a mystery yeah. to us. Yeah. Well, I was still uh, granted. Uh, Jimmy Webb was doing these sophisticated kind of songs, and I was just puttering around trying to get something out there. So uh, he had an influence on me as something to strive for. You know, uh, Jimmy, how do you how do you come up with these fantastic songs? I mean, look at MacArthur Park. It's yeah. like five minutes. They played the whole thing. So uh, these little works of art that he did, I uh, combination between him and Elton John, I think were the two reigning, my two reigning heroes that uh, influenced me the most because of their, uh, I don't know, part of their, maybe their, some of their classical influence leaked in to, to what they were writing with and their, their, and there was a lot of poetry in their lyrics. So right. uh uh, it had a, a compelling effect on me was I was a kid. Yeah, right. I think, and that's what I'm trying to get across to the listeners is is it wasn't just about I was making a bunch of noise and they were recording it or I was witnessing no. that. It was like what they were singing and, you know, like when I talk about Wichita Linemen and how heartbreaking yeah. it was, it was yeah. just like that's that's not a simple thing. That really is an art and it's it really, really, is. really when is. that is your baseline yeah. <laughs> that you're yeah. working off, it's just incredible yeah. that here's where, here this is what you need to do and this is what I'm going to try to do and stuff. Yeah. I think that, and I think it, um, I read you had some early success with your dad writing a theme song for Ironside early on. I did. I and, did. I was just out of high school, and my father got the show from Quincy Jones that turned my father on to the show Ironsides, which was a cop uh, kind yeah. of a thriller uh, uh, series with episodic. Well, the producer, Cy Shermack, decided that he wanted to have a song featured in the beginning of every show with, yeah. with a little bit of the story content seeping into the uh, – the storyline if possible wow. so I, I told my dad i raised my hand and said dad give me a chance doing this and yeah. i did good on the first one and i got hired at like you know 500 dollars a week the total buyout and you did do a song every 10 days is another episode so it kind of forced me to do this uh hired for work for hire writing and it got my, i got to hone my chops because there was a series every episode every week so you had to do it and uh uh, it was uh, it worked out okay because it was part of my experience. And you ended up getting an Emmy for that. That's that's I you did. know pretty incredible at such a young uh, age. You're just like uh, wow, yeah. um, that stuff's great when it just comes naturally like that. And I got to ask you this question: hearing you talk about that, because I was working on a Netflix show called The Ranch, where it was a similar situation where the producers liked my music and they said write as much as you can, and we're going to try and get right. it. Well, it was a very different process for me when they were kind of feeding me storylines to write about right compared to just sitting down and thinking well what am i going to write today Can you, what was that like for you would you find it was simpler to write that way or is it simpler to write the other way i think it was challenging but but it, but it helped me focus on a direction because i didn't have to decide what the subject matter was about you know it yeah. would be a dysfunctional a little uh kid who was lost and just with a dysfunctional family. So you just kind of had to write subtext, which is about, uh, uh, you know, maybe what's going on in the person's heart or what's yeah. going on in their mind and stuff like that. So I had a lot of freedom, but it's still, I was guided. I had guidelines from the yeah. script. It seems like that. It seems like it's really like you get some of the hard part out of the way when someone says, okay, I want you to write about this subject matter yeah. here. It's like, then you can kind of focus on what you're doing. That does seem like a nicer way, easier way. I'm not sure if that's the right term, but um, 
for me, it, it was a lot easier to have that out of the way instead of just sitting there thinking about what, what do I want to write about today? And so yeah. you also had some early success. I read um, working with Cheryl Lynn, got to be yeah. real. Yeah, that was and, about the same time as the first Toto album there. You know, and, in between that, I worked with Seals and Crofts. What was and, like my first hit record was Diamond Girl. I played on really uh, when I was 18. And uh, after wow. that, I worked with Steely Dan and then uh, Boz Skaggs. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because everybody knows Boz Skaggs, Low Down, we heard that song the right. same. I mean, these were yeah. huge, huge songs. Um, but getting in the door for Steely Dan, if you're a musician, you know, that's not always a simple or easy process. No. They were no. very particular about the musicians they wanted to let in the door. And even then, if you would actually make it onto the record, they were very particular. Right. And so they how are. did you manage to get in the door for that project? Jeff Percaro became friends, met uh, uh, their guitarist, uh, Denny Diaz, who played on uh, oh. you know, uh, Real, uh, the, the Prince of Logic album. Right. And, uh, and he, Denny at that time was mixing their records and recording them too. He was a full-fledged engineer. Really? So uh, Jeff uh, said, uh, Denny said, uh, Jeff, Jeff asked him, uh, you know, if we could come down there, you know, and said, Denny, they wanted the hires to play on... Uh, one re one tune, which was night by night, so yeah. they liked us so much that they ended up uh, having Jeff play on I think called Parker's Band. I think it's on Pretzel Logic album, and then we followed up with um, on the Katie Light album. Um, myself and Jeff, we got to play on uh, Black Friday, and I and Doctor Wu on the Katie wow. Light album. So they were again, they were very particular, and uh, you had to be. They just thought of us as session players, you know, as we could come in and do. A specific function for this song you know they're very particular very uh logical yeah and and they would even i think maybe i'm wrong but the even when it came to leads in a song they might cut between two or three different players sometimes oh yeah absolutely it, it, it's it, that's a tough that's a tough one to walk in and do i mean that's just legendary as far as i know trying to get in those sessions and have something like make it onto the record it certainly is you it's know a big deal is. But you got to work with so many people I was reading, and, and the list is so amazing. Like, there's so many yeah. different artists, uh, and I saw, like, Motley Crue was on there. And, um, and Quincy Jones, of course, Pink, Aretha Franklin, Miles Davis, which is incredible, Ray Charles, like you mentioned, and stuff. These are, these are all well-known, big-time yeah. singer-songwriters and getting in on those sessions like that. Um, Especially Miles, think, Miles Davis, that was a big one, you know. Yeah, where he, yeah. He was, he was a he was recording in my house. He wanted to record "Human Nature," a song Steeper Carl had written with yeah. Michael, and uh, he thought it was it had a great melody. So he recorded it in my house. It means and Steve Lugather and I had written a song called "Don't Stop Me Now," a slow jazz ballad, and uh, we asked Miles if he would put his uh, we would play a solo on it. And he said yes, and that was just we were blown away. Because he's he's usually turns down everything everybody asks him for, so yeah. when we were pleasantly surprised. Of course, we had a friend there, Tommy Lafuma, big uh, <laughs> record guy, yeah. who was a friend of ours, who kind of was liaison between us and, and Miles at the house. So it helped uh, helped Miles uh, make his decision there a little bit because we were yeah. friends with Tommy. You know, do you think? Um you got to work with so many of these people or you got in the door, you got calls from so many of them um, because like we were talking about at the beginning of this, you, you understood not just the process in the recording studio, but you understood about songwriting being yeah. such an important part of it, yeah. you know, whereas even the, just the melody of something can be such a big part and the lyrics, but it all has to work together so well. And do you think like all of that was part of it getting in for those artists? I think so. I think the fact that I approached piano played from a songwriter's point, piano, song, songwriter's point of view. You know, if they, I would come in, if they had a little ballad -y kind of thing, sometimes it would sound reminiscent of an Elton John song. So I was familiar with all these styles and yeah. I could play like, like I was the singer, a, a songwriter. I would just play those kind of parts as opposed to just going in and flailing away on the piano, you know? Uh, right, right. Uh, I was sensitive to each artist and their songs. I tried to approach it like I would do if it was my own personal song and play mainly keep your part real simple and try and stay out of the way of the vocal, you know? 
Yeah, which I think that's really a gift. Again, I probably came from your youth and and watching the the whole process and how it's all put yeah. together because I've I've hired many many musicians and you see that all the time. There's people who are like, "This is what I do, man," you know, <laughs> and, and you're just like, "Okay, thanks yeah, for right. that." Or or someone like yourself who might understand it's not about you; it's about this song. We're trying to create a sound together, and all these pieces have to fit together to to make it work. Right. And somehow it seems like you you understood that probably from your early perspective, and you got on these records. But then you get a call to work on the biggest record of all time. How, you tell me about getting the call to work with Michael Jackson on the Thriller and the Bad records, because. No, I mean, there's not a person on the planet who hasn't listened to you if you're playing on that record, right? Yeah, right. That was started, I have to go back to um, when I was 14, I met Quincy Jones. My dad, again, I got in, wow. did the Iron Sights uh, about four years later. We did that. But my dad was working, arranging for Quincy Jones on his solo records. So I got to go to Quincy's house and meet him firsthand. And once you are in Quincy's uh, family, you know, like I was brought in as, as a family member here. He's like, I would call him Uncle Q, you know? Yeah. And uh, uh, later on, uh, when I was doing sessions, uh, some of the guys in my band, Steve Ricardo in particular, was doing Quincy Jones sessions. So Steve invited me down and I got to come down and watch a session. And they had me as long as I was down there. Uh, Steve says, why don't you let David play this part that you're trying to do? So I started playing a couple of parts and the, the engineer really liked me, Bruce Wedeen. So they recommended that I stay down there and keep keep working. And uh, <laughs> I did a couple of different albums. I think it was James Ingram and one was Donna Summer's album wow. we did. And then uh, the Michael Jackson thing came up after Off the Wall, once he was going to produce another album. So everybody was kind of he very eager to get yeah. on that record, you know what I yeah. mean? And everybody yeah. knew it was going to be a great record. Of course, no one knew it was going to go through the root ceiling and, uh, you know, be the biggest selling album of all time here. But, uh, uh, again, uh, it was, it was just by trying to be in the right place at the right time and knowing, and, and when you get your, finally get your chance coming through with the right parts and playing the right parts, you know, and yeah. there's very few, very select few people that he uses, you know, which yeah. is, Greg Fillin Gaines, David Foster, and myself, you know, yeah. uh, playing keys. And then there's, uh, you know, Steve Bercaro and Michael Boddicker on sense, JR and Jeff Bercaro on drums. It doesn't go too far outside that circle. Yeah, which it's, for those who don't know, listening in LA or even Nashville, they, you know, when you're a producer and you have a system that's working, right. you just don't mess with it. You know, yeah. this, you know, this system works and you bring these people in to work on stuff because everybody understands, everybody works well together. Everybody understands what they're shooting for and it all works really well together. So it's, it's a lot like, uh, even in a sports team, you know, when, yeah. when it's all working, you just don't mess with it, you know, and if you yeah. do, it can fall apart. Yeah. <laughs> so they keep it going together. Thank you to our next sponsor, Be Bold Bars. My favorite energy bars are back. Be Bold Bars were founded by Stacy Madison, the founder of Stacy's Pita Chips. They're refrigerated energy bars that are made with nuts, nut butters, chia, honey, maple, and cinnamon. They're delicious on purpose. All four of the bars are gluten-free, dairy-free, and plant-based. These bars have no preservative. That's why they are refrigerated. They hold only great taste, but are such a great alternative to all the garbage that you can get out there trying to find good food. I think you guys should try them. They're a great way to fuel your body and support a woman-owned business. So here's the deal. You're gonna get 20% off if you use the code BOLD, B-O-L-D, for 20% off all four flavors at BeBoldBars.com. That's code BOLD, B-O-L-D, for 20% off beboldbars.com then um somewhere along all of this maze of people you're working with you guys you and was it jeff and steve or just jeff bacarl and you decide we want to form a band that was after the boss gag silk the grease album and then jeff boss wanted to do one more album and i wanted to co-produce the album and but he had different thoughts on that so we went uh my dad said well, whatever you're thinking of trying to do artistically right now, maybe now's the time. So I talked to Jeff. Jeff had joined Steely Dan in the meantime, before that. Yeah. And uh, 
And uh, so I thought, well, the band now that that's all, all hopes of the band happening, reforming from our high school days uh, yeah. it went out the window because Jeff's and Steely Dan. But they, they ended up uh, disbanding their band and, uh, and going on the road. So Jeff was available again. And uh, him and I, we just we, we got the instinct and we just looked at each other. We had been touring with Boss Gag, so we'd been used to playing. We played Day on the Green, I think, with uh, uh, Carlos Santana and Journey, uh, yeah. up to 50,000 people. And we were good performers on stage. We weren't just like uh, session guys that sat in chairs and played the background yeah. stuff. We every, Everybody could perform pretty good in front of crowds. We had experience from freedom from our high school days, playing dances and stuff. So uh, 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 that album, uh, that's how we got uh, uh, decided we wanted to start cutting some demos and see what we could uh, present to an album, to, to a record company, you know? Yeah, and you guys were all like really good players, you know, even I, I guess from a young age yeah. is the thing. I mean, when I was, when I first found myself in LA in a recording studio, I literally had been a drummer all my life. I only had been playing guitar for three or four years and I found myself standing in a recording studio trying to sing a song. So I wasn't, you know, I was just trying to get by on yeah. the instrument and stuff. But you guys were, you know, from from that time and the rumors that go around, it was that you guys were like legendary session players, you know, and, and, and just phenomenal players. And Toto was just a natural thing you threw together because you were so good at doing it and you were playing on everybody's record. Is that true or is that not true not, not really not not so much true what we were doing is we were we were a continuation of our high school days yeah. and we had a band we had a great band in high school two drummers horns and wow. uh it was kind of like tower of power meets uh, <laughs> uh uh santana kind of meets sly stone kind of thing yeah. so we were used to playing <laughs> all this having all this fun in high school playing all these different very kind of rock and roll songs and r b yeah. songs and uh uh, we, we always talked about uh, let's go, let's go on and, and make the band, make a big, form a band. But we decided with our father's uh, wisdom that it would be better to do sessions and get some expertise, get some experience making yeah. records. So by the time we were doing Total Records, we were already veterans of yeah. how the process goes. Yeah. Which is the main thing. I mean, so many groups start out and they've never been through the process before. So yeah. their first albums are usually like you can tell it's the first time that they've been in the studio and my <laughs> producer going through it and where we were experienced enough where we i th i think our album sounded like a third or fourth album in to yeah. our artistry you know when we came out with our first album here because uh uh but we were still trial and error and everything i hadn't sung on uh i'd sung on a couple of things for iron sides but i hadn't sung any <clears throat> each solo i wasn't yeah. a lead singer and yeah. we just kind of by doing it by hit and miss, we went in the studio and I played mini mode bass. Me and Jeff kind of made the first demos together. Then we added Steve Lukather on guitar. That was his audition, which he passed with flying colors. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but I was learning how to sing and trying to come up with a way to uh, double my voice so it would sound presentable. And then we finally found uh, Bobby Kimball, who was in another band that I was uh, asked to produce, but I didn't. It was called SS Fools. And uh, uh, we they they disbanded, so I knew that he was free. So I asked him to come down and rehear and try a song with us, and it was "Hold the Line." And we yeah. all just looked at each other when we played "Hold the Line" the first time, and it sounded damn near like the like the record does the yeah. first time we ever played it. So we knew we had a band, and we knew we were onto something. That's a really cool story. Um, for for me, it was the opposite. I'll just say the we our gift was how green we really were. You know, yeah. the first time I ever got on a plane was to be flown out to the record company out in L.A., right? right. That's how green I was coming from Wisconsin, barely knew. So, you know, that's okay. If that's what you got in the studio, you know, you kind of go with what you got. And so, like, yeah. that's what we went. But you guys were so good at what you did already, again, because of your childhood. And a lot of growing up around L.A., the entertainment industry is kind of natural to you, you know, it in, is. in Wisconsin, it, nobody knows about it. It's all just something you see on TV, you know? So it was all like, it's I like was Milwaukee. learning. It's the Milwaukee sound, isn't it? That's what yeah. you guys had. That's right. Yeah. 
That's right. Lots of beers and <laughs> lots of energy. <laughs> that's great. That's, that's all we got. But I want. I was watching your interview on the CBS Sunday Morning, and you were talking about the critics saying you sounded like a tangerine leisure suit. And I, I wanted to talk to you about some of the critics and stuff like that because I remember people dissing on Toto when I was young, but your stuff seemed really complex to me. And I remember listening on the radio one night where they played the ending of Rosanna. Yeah. You know, it wasn't the radio single version. It was the extended ending. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, sure. And I had never heard that before. And when I heard like Lukather going off on his jam and oh, playing yeah. it out like that, I was just like, this is not simple stuff. I mean, even Jeff Bacarl's drum beat that doon to doon to God to do to doon to doon to God. It's like that's yeah. not those these aren't simple parts. And I was like, no, I couldn't right. make sense of why people were saying this when what I was hearing was not simple at all. Yeah. It was complex, really, yeah. really they're, good music. They're very, they're very elusive how uh, how technical some of the parts are. They just make them sound simple, you know. Right. But believe that's, it or not, though, these guys, Steve Luther there and Jeff, when they were each 15 years old. They played as good as they did when they were 25 years old. I mean, yeah. these guys were un phenomenal players. They even reached, made me open my eyes there's as they had raised the bar so much for me coming yeah. in to that neighborhood uh, of where Jeff Ricardo had a band together. And that was the high school band that we enjoyed. And then Steve Luca there and Steve Ricardo took over that band when we left high school to go out with Sonny and Cher and play live with them on the road. Steve wow. Lukather and Steve Bacaro took over the high school band and kept it going. So that's why they became part of band members because we were all in each other's bands in high school kind of yeah. thing. So uh, uh, you're right, though. L.A. Is the, was the music center of the world. I think more Nashville. I think Nashville is more now. But yeah. uh, uh, they did a lot of sessions, and we were around all those session players. And Jeff Bacaro's father was a professional drummer and percussionist. So we were always right there on the foreground of beginning to hear, uh, meeting all the professionals and, and uh, getting to listen to them firsthand. And, and again, it's being there at that time in L.A., where 70s and 80s, some of the just the best music was being done in my perspective. Um, but your baseline for not just the players now are just phenomenal and the songwriting is phenomenal and the engineers are phenomenal. You just had the best of the best out there kind of at the yeah. same time. And so you had to be at that level, right? I mean, if you were going to yeah. succeed, you really had to understand this is where you, had, this is the starting point, right? Yeah. Yeah. You think the, that pushed we were, you guys along quite a bit, like knowing I, that? I, I think so. I think so. We were very confident at the time that we could do this. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just, we, we wanted to, We've all met in the studio and we decided to form a studio band here and do that. That was not it. We were motivated by uh, by the music. Yeah. The music was always our motivation. And we knew that if we, we wanted to, we, we weren't, disco era was was getting in uh, yeah. infused into radio so much that we were tired of hearing the same old thing over and over. So that's, we wanted to make new music so we could hear some new new, new music on the radio. We make yeah. it, make it, and, make, and making our own. Uh, we had a certain style that we played in, which is uh, which we used to kind of uh, leap into this these Indians when we play on other people's sessions. We'd leap into tell some of these Toto songs, practicing them on other people's sessions. So uh, we <laughs> got a lot of experience, you know, trying ideas because uh, we were in the studio every day. Yeah, and you understood though. Um it wasn't just about that energy of making a great performance on a recording. It's like the energy that when you bring it to an audience, the energy they bring to the whole event, the whole energy that's happening in the room was a really magical place. And you guys wanted to be part of that as well. Absolutely. I think we understood the, the audience dynamic. And well, uh, that's why we, we uh, geared our albums to go out and play it live. You right. know what I mean? On the first album. Right, right. Which is, you know, I always wanted to have so, a couple songs that were just geared for live and then some beautiful songs for listening. And you try to write a song or a record that's balanced that way. Right. I, I want to talk to you about why we're really talking today, which is that you have a solo record coming out or is out. Am I, is it coming out yet? Uh, it's the, out on August 19th. August 19th. I'm sorry. And um, Forgotten Toys. I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Okay. I've been listening to it at home. It's really nice. Um, I've really been enjoying it. Oh, I'm glad you like it. 
Yeah. And um, a couple of things I want to talk to you about on it. For one, one of the things I noticed right away that I've been talking to people forever about is the song is seven songs. It's not right. 17 songs, which is something I really like. I've been trying to make the case for shorter records for a long time because yeah. I think you're able to absorb a record better that way. And if you grew up at all in the time when we played vinyl, there were limits to what you could put on a record. So they had a natural personality to them based on just those songs that got on there. And yes, I really indeed. like that about this record. I released a new record in June that has 10 songs, but I, I always try to keep it down to that number That's two. Good. So was it a conscious choice for you to keep the number down? It definitely was. I had a couple extra songs that were candidates. And at one time we were looking at doing maybe seven or eight songs and stuff like that. But as we narrowed it down, uh, I got to thinking, you know, there's very few artists. So my favorite artists, I can barely listen to 12 or 13 songs with my, the greatest artists. We all know who they are out there. All yeah. the, the, the top guys, you know, I can, t I can, I can last about six or seven songs. Yeah. And so I didn't want to have, I didn't want, I wanted people to, to be wanting more leave them wanting yeah, more as right. opposed to saying, boy, you know, I, I just can't take all this in one listening right here. You know, I want yeah. to be able to sit down and listen to the album as a complete entity, you know? Yeah. And I'd rather put out two or three records with more songs than, and let people just take it in as one unit yeah. first. And I really like that about this because when you listen to the record, you did put a lot into it. There's a lot of beautiful production, a lot of beautiful lyrics and 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 it gives you a chance to really put put a lot into each song and really it make it the most it can be it really does and i love that about this record i love the production i wanted to talk to you about one of the songs that grabbed me right out of the box um was the first time i think you're writing a song to one of your children yeah to my daughter my only daughter my only child is a girl she's 33 right now and uh, that was i'm glad you noticed that because that was a that's a very special song yeah. That's one of the first songs that we recorded. Um, yeah. I, I put a song on my record called Loved, which I had written literally 20 years ago when my kids were like two. Right. And they're, they're like 21 now, too. So it's like it took me a while to get it on there. But uh, did, I, fi I finally did. It's really nice, though, to have that perspective, to be looking back at your child growing up yeah. like that and being able to sing a beautiful song like that. Yeah. It's really unusual. Uh, uh, I don't write many songs like that that are first person perspective where I'm writing a sensitive uh, topic like that. But it was I was able to cha channel my my thoughts to my daughter and to real life experiences right here and to watching her come of age. It's kind yeah. of kind of coming of age song. And uh, uh, again, we started uh, the what you hear in the very first uh, four bars. That's my demo. That's the demo of the song. And yeah. then he added the rest of it on top of the demo, you know. So That's beautiful. Uh, we're still playing, trying to maintain the original flow and the, the and the seed that was planted originally. We tried to keep those in, in the album. You know what I mean? That was put part of our, our journey was yeah. taking these little pieces of demos and and re and re refreshing them, you know. Which, right, which is what we should talk about. I guess first, uh, this record you put together, um, tell me about how it, why now, kind of how it came about. Um, and I'll let you speak to that because I read about it, but I want you to talk about okay. it. Um, I had always felt, uh, you know, the, 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 the guys in the band had been doing solo records for a while. Because Steve Luker had done 10 solo records and Joseph had done about seven or eight. And yeah. uh, they were working on new solo records. So they were urging me, Toto had some time off. They'd just come off a big tour, urging me to get a jump in to put out a solo record. And I, I just told him, I said, I'm very satisfied with, with the, my efforts on the Toto records, where I feel like, uh, you know, if I was doing a solo record, that's how I would have done my solo records, is I would have called those guys and played and played on them like that. You yeah. know? So, uh, uh, they said, but they said, no, you have these other pieces that aren't, necessarily Toto things do their Dave things and uh and also finding a vehicle I'm I don't have a I have a very limited vocal range so yeah. there's only certain songs I can sing on a Toto record which is why I don't sing that much uh because we have other good singers great singers yeah. and uh, uh it allows me to 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 occasionally rear my head and sing on a song here but this was going to force me to uh 
make sure I had melodies that I could sing and that could show my, uh, 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 what I could do. I just yeah. kind of proved to my, it was kind of proving to myself I can actually do a solo record. You know, it was a yeah. big thing for me to get yeah. over, to get closure on it. And it was, uh, it helped the fact that there was uh, COVID had, uh, was in full force. And so everybody, uh, people were, were complaining about having to stay at home and work. And I have a recording studio at home. So, uh, it, it wasn't anything that new to me to working at home, you know, yeah. except we started using the uh, zoom and, uh, FaceTime. Uh, I remember when working with Dean parks where he had an app where you could, uh, I could hear his, uh, his, uh, what was coming out, his speakers. I had the same kind of speakers and they could, it would broadcast over my system at my house. So wow. I could watch him play and, and hear him at my studio. It was really great. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, technology. I was going to say, I've talked to a lot of people, including myself, who did COVID records. And it really yeah. seemed like COVID was a renaissance for the arts. You know, I don't it know. If, I don't know if it'll get reach, get out to the public well enough. But for maybe looking back, they'll see that this was a time when an incredible amount of art was made because you lock artists down and say you can't go outside. What are they going to do? Right. You know, you just yeah, start right. finding some way to yeah. do the art that you want to do. Another yeah. song that really stood out to me on there was uh, All the Tears That Shine. It sounded yeah. it, like a very personal song to me. Very personal song. And that was, uh, I, I put that vocal performance on there because that was the demo vocal, believe it or not. Oh, wow. M M Michael Sherwood and I wrote that. Michael Sherwood passed away this last year. So oh, I wanted sorry. to kind of honor him in a homage. I uh, wanted to put that vocal out because I recorded the song sing with me singing on Total 14. But I was not happy. It was not the moving experience I had wanted. And I, I revisited the demo, which had his vocal on it. And it was so compelling, so moving, that I just said, I want to redo this record here, but keep the vocal and, uh, and put it out. Because I thought, I, th I just think it feels one of my best efforts as a songwriter. And uh, it's my last song that I wrote with him as a co-writer, you know, and so it had a, it had some different levels of personal meaning. Really, really beautiful song too. Thank you. Um, another song that immediately stood out to me is the last song on the record though, Lucy, because most people don't know this about me, but I, I love jazz music. I always have. And again, the, if, if you're the fan of the shorter amount of songs on a record, you look at the old jazz records, they were always like that. You know, they yeah. always had like five songs maybe on them. And, 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 and I love that about them. I love the personality that they had. Lucy just, I was like, wow. You know, just like you were kind of just showing your chops, yeah. I believe, but yeah. but you wouldn't hear this on a total record. So it was beautiful to hear no, it. No, you wouldn't record. hear it on a total record. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, I got to work out with, again, a lot of these people on the, on the album I'm playing on are my close friends. And yeah. they were just done, uh, you know, everybody was calling me, we, can, we want to work on your album, we want to work on your album. People like Mike McDonald, and uh, I had to ask him to work on the album, and he said yes, like, so quickly, it was great. And I had Don Felder uh, wow. work on the album, and Steve Jordan, who's in the Stones now. They yeah. had to but back to Lucy, I wanted that to be that song experience, is showing my range, because I had been a frustrated, I still am a frustrated jazz pianist. You know, that's what I really like to do. But there's so many great jazz pianists yeah. out there. And it's really a higher, it's really a rarefied air up there in the jazz. <laughs> you know? Yes, it is. And yes, so, it is. Uh, uh, that's Mike Lang actually playing the piano solo on that. Wow. Uh, a guy I co-wrote the song with. So uh, we were going to do a duet album at the time about seven or eight years ago. And we laid down this track. And then I started overdubbing it on more and decided uh, it fit on my trying to find a place, a home for it, I realized it was perfect for my solo record. Yeah. Well, and why I love jazz myself is kind of the opposite is I can't play it and I don't even try to play it, you know, yeah. but I hear so much rock and pop in my life of playing music that it's nice to come home and put on this other thing that just, Absolutely. I don't have to think about anything. It's just how beautiful it sounds and I just let it be what it is. So I Absolutely. was really... I was really pleasantly surprised when I heard it on the record there. I was just oh, like, oh, boy, if, if everybody could just jump off and do something like that in their record, it would be yeah. really beautiful. You mentioned you recorded at home. You know, when you and I started recording records, it was on tape in studios with great engineers and everybody had to be somewhere together and working. And now 
we're in this new world of working apart. And um, what's your perspective on it compared when you compare the two? Well, first of all, it's not as much fun as it used to be. Of course, yeah. I don't. I didn't think that uh, dealing with cutting tape because we used to cut tape a lot and do a lot <laughs> of better stuff. You couldn't just uh, hit a button and have it. Uh, uh, normalized, put together like they do now. But uh, uh, I think everybody's missing a step uh, from the old days. I, I, and I'm not one of these old guys that just says, hey, the old days were the best and everything. Because yeah. I like, I think it's challenging for musicians. And I think only musicians that have experienced some of the old days where you were in the room making it, I think the technology is uh, more comfortable in their hands because they yeah. know what to do with it. They know how to respect the technology. You know what I mean? Or yeah. here guys are doing hundreds and hundreds of tracks of overdubbing. You know what I mean? Yeah. In Pro Tools and stuff like that, where I try and keep it down to uh, under 100 tracks now <laughs> <laughs> on, my, on my own personal stuff. It's still yeah. challenging, but I find that uh, you use some of these techniques like bouncing down and, and yeah. just grouping stuff uh, come in very handy. And uh, I embrace the new technology because uh, I still have a Studer 24 track sitting in my studio to remind me of how difficult it was to make <laughs> records on tape in the old days, you know. <laughs> but uh, there was uh, there was a certain uh, camaraderie and certain uh, uh, by being able to listen to the other players and adjust your part at the time, where everybody's yeah. making adjustments simultaneously. Where now, when you get a guy's part on there, you can't adjust to he can't adjust you have to play a part that fits in with everything. So it's challenging in a different way. Yeah, I keep wondering, though, um, if somehow, you know, I, I, there's a book called Recording the Beatles that I read a while ago that was talked yeah. about how they recorded all their music. And, and, and in a way, they were using the technology they had at the time, just like they were. we do now. But I keep wondering if there's going to be a time where we take this technology but still kind of get back to that bunch of us in a room playing yeah, music right. together again yeah. because when i go back and listen to some of the 50s blues records or something recordings oh, where yeah. they, they had one microphone in the room and That's everyone's right. kind of playing around it didn't it wasn't high fidelity but man did it sound good somehow you know? Good. Good. you know i i'm a i i'm i'm a kindred soul when it comes to that stuff with you you know i yeah. love the way when something's more raw and uh less microphones and uh, just kind of capturing it, you know what yeah. I mean? I yearn, I yearn for those days to come back when we could do it, you know what I mean? And, right, the magic uh, I of a... What, I think that's what part of the live experience playing is, is people miss that playing alive, that that magical thing that you can't describe to people that happens when, when everybody's playing together and in the zone yeah. uh, live. I think the, doing it, I think the, that's why so many people are out there playing live because they... They like the live experience, probably uh, tantamount to uh, uh, the the uh, the re studio experience of laying things down one at a time. You know, yeah. Sometimes you almost have to when you take it live, you have to readjust the song to play it live because it, you find that it didn't quite you know what works on the record right. with you just sitting in a room didn't work as well being on a stage full of people. That's right. And, and that's so right. you. Uh, that's part of that process, but but it would be great to get back to that too. Sure um, the thing I that agree. was cool about the Total Records back in the '80s, though, is you couldn't hide stuff. You know, you had to play it. Like those records sound like the band sounded. You yes. know, you couldn't and just we were make playing, it we were all. In the studio. We were all in the studio playing live on those records. Right. So you know when you I mean? so we had that experience, how to do that, you know, and it was very fast. It was it was it was a lot of fun. Making yeah. the great, I think. I think I'll always look back on the first record like the most fun that we had. You know what I mean? And yeah. I say so you get start getting pigeonholed by a record company or them wanting to repeat the the uh, formula. They think there's a yeah. formula. Here's your first album goes double platinum. Now give us part two of the first album. You know what I mean? And we yeah. were we had been started playing live, so we were making adjustments to do more progressive rock or alternative rock to uh, make a more interesting live show, you know? Yeah. But again, um, because you were raised in that culture, I can't help but think like a lot of artists really struggle to deal with the music industry, the music business, you know, yes. because it can really get in the way of the art or the music, you know, the energy you're trying to create over here. And I think a yeah. lot of people struggle with dealing with it, but being raised in it, you, 
I would think you understood it kind of at an early age, like this is a business, it's not just me noodling yeah. around on some instrument. Yeah, well, I was very lucky, very fortunate. My mom was a, was a, um, a corporate bookkeeper and my dad was a musician. So together, yeah. <laughs> between them, I learned a little bit of the law, the ins and outs of music and that you need a lawyer and then you want to maintain your own pubs. The best thing they ever taught me was to maintain my own publishing, which I still have yeah. to maintain. You know, yeah. and words of wisdom and uh, yeah. and uh, everybody else got set up with their own publishing companies too at that yeah. time. So we'd know there'd be no inner fighting amongst all that stuff, you know? So we sidestepped a few things. Yeah, money can get in the way of all of it. So yeah. it's it's great if you have someone around you or you have some good advice or someone who could trust. It's looking out like for you, you know? Yeah, which yeah. is hard to find. It's not a simple thing by any means. It is. Most people want to take a piece of everything you do. Yeah. So that's so, so true. Um, you guys going to be out doing shows in 22, 23? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Toto is, uh, uh, has plans to open for Journey again. Wow. Uh, 40, 40 dates in the wow. States. That last tour works out so good in arenas. We were, they were selling out like 12,000 to 20,000 seat arenas opening for Journey. And it was great because the crowds were actually showing up before Toto. Uh, came on as opposed yeah. to drifting in during the concert here. So yeah, yeah. Uh, they found it very successful and uh, uh, they're going to do, I think, I believe the band's going to do uh, uh, 40 more dates next year. Yeah, because uh, those are similar fans. If you like Journey, yeah. you like Toto. You know, that's just yeah. similar fans. I think, so. I think so. Well, man, I really want to thank you for sitting down and talking to me. I learned so much about you that I didn't know, and it was really yeah. enlightening. I've been a fan of your music since way back when. You know, I can't play as well as you guys play, but I, I'm in awe oh, of it. I think it's so good, and I love what you do. I want everybody to go out and look for David's solo record, Forgotten Toys. Thank comes you. out in August, so we'll be looking for that and give it a listen to. Really it's a beautiful record. It. And thank you for the Bo those Bodine records, man. Yeah, man. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we're still putting them out um, and That's still good. playing like you guys. We still That's just good. keep going out there and playing. Uh, I'm going to catch up. I'm gonna have to do some catching up and seeing what you're doing lately. That would be awesome. Yeah, I put out yeah. a record in June. Oh, okay. I got a song from my, my kid, too. Is it, a, is it a solo record? No, it's a Bodine's record. And, and okay. you know, for me, it's always different to... Uh, right. I love it. To, because I did this record myself, but there's a... The way I distinguish Bodine's or a solo record is Bodine's record is a guitar driven record. And uh, my solo stuff comes from my drummer background and it's a rhythm driven record. So right. that's how I separate oh, the two out. So, so we're going to hear one. a different side of you on that too. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I hope you come check us out. I hope to see you somewhere on the road or somewhere because I hope uh, so. I hope so. I, hope you look up. I feel like really? I know you forever right now. Oh. You know what I mean, great, man. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah, Listen, I've listened to yeah. music late at night on the radio. Uh, it was a beautiful thing. Oh, great. Thank so you, you very much. And take no care of yourselves. Thank all of our fans out there, Fran, fans, friends, and family for their support. Because uh, as you know, we wouldn't be anywhere without our fans. That's know? right. That's right. And if the people need information on where you're going to be, is there a website they can go to? Look up for me on Instagram or uh, Facebook or uh uh, Toto.com, you know, Toto99.com, yeah. our Facebook thing, you know. We'll do it. Otherwise, look for David Page, Forgotten Toys, and I'm sure it'll come up on the internet. Spotify, it'll come up on Spotify. Yeah. Too, you know. Okay. Well, you take care of yourself. I hope to see you soon. Okay. And Amazon. Amazon, and, Amazon. and Spotify. I'm That's right. Remember. That's right. Okay, good to see you. Nice to meet you. And you as well. hope we get to do this again sometime. I hope so, too. Take care. Thanks a lot. Appreciate All it. Right. Bye. Bye. There you have it. Great interview with Mr. David Page. I really enjoyed researching him because there's so much I didn't know about. And listening to uh, Toto's music as a kid was really inspiring to me. So I really enjoyed it. I hope you guys did too. Please subscribe to the podcast. Send it around to your friends. Go everywhere that they play podcasts and subscribe. Um, because otherwise I'm just sitting here and I want you to join me. So please join me staring at the world with Kurt Newman. Thanks for listening to Staring at the World with Bodine's Kurt Newman, a podcast about creative innovation. Please be sure to download, subscribe, rate, and review, and keep listening wherever you get your podcasts.